these viruses. And IPL, when we're talking about dry eye, is a great way to uh, kill uh, overgrowth of gram-positive bacteria on the lid margin and also to uh, kill Demodex. Now I have this little uh, gin and tonic. So if uh, this is one of the themes that I'm going to be talking about and what this has to do with the pandemic. Uh, so if you want to pull yourself up a, a gin and tonic while we're doing this, uh, it'll make the, the presentation more enjoyable and me funnier. All right, so uh, when this uh, pandemic started, we started hearing from our politicians, of course, and what I think happens is we tend to romanticize the politicians of the past. So I'm gonna be talking about some American uh, politics during uh, epidemics and pandemics and also some European politics. But let's start with the, uh, the American founding fathers. So this is our view of the American founding fathers, very stately, uh, knowing uh, everything, uh, having an intuitive power on how to handle a crisis. So there you have on the top George Washington and uh, Alexander Hamilton is here. This is a doctor who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. That's Dr. Benjamin Rush. He actually has a medical school named for him in Chicago. And this is uh, Thomas Jefferson. So when we're looking at these paintings and photos, we think, okay, these guys have the answer. So one thing that was going on around in the United States was that people are saying, well, we're bungling this pandemic. And if we had the founding fathers here, they would know what to do. Well, interesting enough, in the early American history, our capital was in Philadelphia and our temporary capital was in Philadelphia and yellow fever broke out in 1993. So all of these founding fathers were there and they had to deal with uh, one out of every five Philadelphians dying. So let's see how they basically handled it. Well, they didn't handle it any better than uh, governments are handling uh, disease now, our founding fathers didn't know uh, what to do. So we had a very interesting dynamic because uh, Jefferson and uh, Hamilton did not like each other. Uh, each of them thought of each other as a rival for being the next president of uh, the United States. And then here, Benjamin Rush uh, didn't like George Washington. Benjamin Rush actually uh, tried to take George Washington away from being our general during, during the American Revolution, and uh, George Washington and Hamilton uh, never forgave him for that, uh, but he was friends uh, with Jefferson. Both, uh, uh, both Hamilton and Jefferson were arguing on what to do with and how to handle this uh, yellow fever breakout in Philadelphia. So Hamilton believed that it was an influx of immigrants, so his solution was to close down the ports. And Jefferson believed that since this outbreak started in the poorest parts of Philadelphia, uh, he thought it was because of squalor. And so did Benjamin Rush think that this was squalor. And, George Washington was taking uh, information uh, from both of these uh, both of these people. So we know yellow fever is uh, trans is a virus. It's a flavivirus that's uh, transmitted by uh, Aegyptes, uh, which is the same mosquito that transfers over the Zika virus. So uh, to bring this back into medical, we had a tale of two doctors. So. Uh, Benjamin Rush had his ideas on what this disease was and how they should treat it. And then there was another doctor there that had an idea on how to treat this, and that was Dr. Uh, Edward Stevens. So kind of let's look at a little bit of history of these. So Benjamin Rush was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, so he was revered. Uh, but he was one of the instigators of the Conway Cabal, which was a... Uh, 
uh, plot to remove George Washington as general uh, of the of the army, the Revolutionary Army. He agreed with Jefferson on what the reason was for the disease, but he thought that the best way to treat this was bloodletting and mercury. And what was very interesting is at the time, there was doctors that had, had dealt with yellow fever before, and they tried to tell uh, Benjamin Rush that uh, bloodletting and mercury doesn't work. Now, what does bloodletting do? Bloodletting will uh, bring death to these uh, infected people quicker due to cardiac arrest. And, you know, pushing mercury uh, is toxic. And that's where we get this mad as a hatter uh, um, because mercury was used by hatters to uh, make the hats. And after a while, they would get this toxic reaction where uh, their mental capacities would go down. They'd have shivers. And uh, if you uh, think of Alice in Wonderland and how the, the Mad Hatter was reacting, then you kind of know what mercury toxicity uh, looks like. Now, Edward Stevens, uh, who was not born in the United States, was born uh, in the West Indies, and he was uh, taught in Europe and uh, medicine. He was, at one point, the president of the Royal Medical Society. And uh, his treatment, and the other thing, and this will get into Hamilton in a second, but actually his family adopted uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, when he was a child. So these Hamilton and, and Edward Stevens grew up as brothers. Now, since he did have that West Indies background, their treatment of this was completely different. It was using quinine, which were, this is where you get into your gin and tonic, but we'll get into that in a little bit, uh, wine and cold baths. And Alexander Hamilton, when he got the disease, he had to make a decision on who he was going to go to uh, to get medical care. And luckily, he had a beef with Benjamin Rush uh, because of the Conway cabal, and they were on opposite sides of the political spectrum, one being a Federalist uh, and the other one being a Democratic Republican. So obviously he's gonna to go to Stevens. And so uh, instead of going to Rush, and this is where politics, you know, I'm not going to this doctor because his politics is opposite of mine, actually probably uh, saved Alexander Hamilton uh, from death, from bloodletting and mercury. Now, what was interesting is, so what was George Washington and Jefferson doing during this time? Well, of course, in the beginning, they said, we're going to stay here and um, we're going to brave this yellow fever out and uh, we're going to stay with our people until uh, one of Thomas Jefferson's um, uh, employees uh, wound up dying of yellow fever. So now it didn't be it wasn't something that just happened in the area of squalor but it happened uh, right then and there to uh, somebody who was at a little bit higher stature. So Jefferson said, okay, I'm out of here. Uh, this is too close to home and I'm going to Monticello. And then he convinced George Washington to do the same. So Washington and Jefferson fled. They turned to Hamilton and said, Hamilton, you, you kind of take care of this uh, new Republic here in, in our capital capital. So then Hamilton wrote to them and said, look, I think uh, I'm sick, I've got yellow fever. And George Washington said, look, you'll be okay, just stay there. And he sent him uh, six bottles of wine. And Jefferson thought that this was a political ploy by Hamilton to gain favor, that he was braving out yellow fever while Jefferson uh, was hiding out in Monticello. So he told everybody that uh, Hamilton uh, was faking which uh, eventually Jefferson did admit that Hamilton uh, was sick. So you kind of see this playing out today in what we're going through with COVID, that it's become a kind of a political football on how to treat it and uh, what was the best way to handle this and 
this person's not handling a ride and that person's not handling a ride. And believe me, uh, when it comes to these viruses and pandemics and epidemics, uh, people and the government really, all of this politics that goes on uh, always happens. So there were some myths that um, had some uh, severe consequences. One of the myths was that blacks could not contract the, the disease. So what happened in Philadelphia is they made um, the black population in Philadelphia uh, do all the nursing care and, and dig the graves uh, and do this. So blacks actually, uh, a proportion of blacks did die because they were uh, still out there doing all the work. Weird things like cleaning the house with vinegar was said to be a way to uh, stop yellow fever. Chewing garlic was a way. Uh, shooting guns in the street. So if you're wondering why in the U.S. we're buying more guns as this pandemic goes on, it's it's probably um, goes back to our, our history. We believe shooting guns actually will drive away a pandemic. Uh, tobacco was used as a treatment. But what was very interesting is that tobacco wasn't a treatment, of course, but there were people that were taking care of these patients who contracted yellow fever, like doctors that smoked tobacco. And it turns out that the smoke from, from smoking, uh, from, from using this tobacco actually drove away the mosquitoes from those people who were smoking. So in a way, you know, we always say smoking is bad, but in this case, the smoking actually probably saved uh, some lives. Okay, so now let's go to Europe. And just, I want you to remember the quinine uh, treatment from uh, yellow fever. So this is a quote from Winston Churchill, gin and tonic has saved more Englishmen's lives and minds than all the doctors uh, in the empire. So uh, what was he uh, talking about? And this has reverberations to, to even today. So quinine is found in uh, tonic and um, quinine goes way back 400 uh, years ago where the chincona bark uh, from trees in uh, Peru and other places uh, was used to, uh, was boiled, quinine was extracted from the bark and quinine was used as a tonic uh, to combat malaria. So it turns out that quinine is a very good way to get rid of the parasite. What it does is it prevents the parasite from breaking down uh, the hemoglobin in blood and uh, reproducing. So if you drink this tonic with quinine in it and you have malaria, it will cure you. So what uh, Winston Churchill was talking about is that uh, when they were colonizing and extending the uh, English empire, one of the reasons why they couldn't was malaria. And one of the reasons why a lot of European countries couldn't conquer different parts of the world was that their troops would die of malaria. And so when they discovered this uh, chincona bark, and discovered that quinine would actually uh, treat these patients with malaria and, and cure them, it allowed them to go ahead and uh, colonize uh, many of these parts of the world like Africa, America, and other places. So when Winston Churchill talks about gin and tonic, what he's saying is that what the English were doing is this tonic had a really bitter taste. And to cut down on the bitter taste, uh, what the English soldiers were doing is that they were taking their tonic uh, with a little bit of gin. And this is how the whole birth of uh, gin and tonic uh, happened. But quinine took on a magical uh, place in medicine where quinine was used in just about uh, every sickness that came along. And for every uh, pandemic that came along, as just like yellow fever, 
they thought, okay, well, quinine works for malaria. Let's give quinine uh, for, for yellow fever. So it's found in the bark of chinchona. Uh, it has been used for treatment for years. It has a magical place because uh, the king of Spain in the 1700s uh, had a really bad bout of malaria. He had uh, some quinine uh, tonic and he was cured. So then it became a very valuable commodity to have uh, in your arsenal. And it then took on the place of, uh, if you have uh, arthritis, quinine. If you're sick, quinine. So it was given for, for many things. Uh, allowed countries like Britain to conquer uh, many lands that had malaria. Uh, these medications now have a, so quinine uh, turned into chloroquine, which turned into hydroxychloroquine. And we're going to, we're going to talk about this progression and the history of that. But uh, chloroquine, and we know Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine is used for lupus and arthritis because it has some anti-inflammatory uh, properties. When the pandemic started, Again, quinine was turned into, hey, uh, uh, these medications work for, uh, for COVID. And then you started getting videos of, hey, there's quinine in uh, Canada Dry. Now, this is a different, the quinine in uh, Canada Dry, and you could look at this uh, by fluorescent light, and it will show up the, the quinine. But uh, quinine in uh, Canada Dry is not from the chinchona, so the quinine is much less. You get much less yield uh, out of uh, the mejia tree. So the if you wanted quinine, which I'm going to tell you, you don't want quinine, chloroquine, and hydroxychloroquine uh, for these diseases, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second you would have to drink two liters to equal uh, one little tablet of a quinine pill. So uh, when these things on YouTube and social media popped up, oh, drink this and it will prevent you from getting COVID. Uh, it, it's just another crazy story. Um, and so it, the mechanism of action, it stops the breakdown of heme uh, by the parasite, so the parasite winds up dying. But quinine turned to chloroquine, which turned into hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Every pandemic that happens, uh, these medications uh, come up because of their magical history. So if you look at yellow fever, how, how did some people treat it? Quinine. If you look at the Spanish flu, how do people treat it? Quinine. Another thing to think about when we talk about the Spanish flu, which was in uh, 1918, is there was all these theories on how to treat by the medical community, one being aspirin. So they tried to decrease the inflammation that you were getting from Spanish flu because of, because of cytotoxic storm, and they said aspirin. So they gave so much aspirin that you were having patients die of uh, aspirin uh, toxicity. But the uh, what I was talking about in King Charles, uh, it's been called, called holy bark, Jesuit bark, uh, has a magical um, uh, magical aura around it, and from that. Quinine, when chloroquine was invented in the 30s, chloroquine took over uh, that magical post. And then when we got Plaquenil uh, later on, that took on the magical post. So if you look at every pandemic that we have and have had, uh, these names will always come up. And one is because of its aura, but two is that uh, we want to grab on to something when these pandemics happen that uh, we can say, oh, if we take this, then this will keep us from dying or this will keep us um, uh, from being very sick. So from Chincona became a valuable commodity, 
and uh, they started to import it to other places. When they couldn't import it, they started to grow it in other places. So eventually, the Java Islands uh, by the Dutch uh, was making 90% of the quinine. Well, when World War II uh, broke out, and you're having uh, battles in the South Pacific, Africa, and other places, uh, this became a valuable resource, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the quinine trade was blocked off. Uh, to the Allies, so they had to come up with something else, and this is where chloroquine uh, was made. So they had a derivative of chloroquine. So you see 1934 to 1947, what happened was the first iteration of chloroquine, uh, and this may be a rumor, not a rumor, but it circulated that if you took this pill that it was going to make you impotent. So a lot of the soldiers uh, decided they weren't going to take the pill, uh, so they had to uh, go ahead and make up, the Allied forces had to make up their own uh, Chincona farms, and so they did that in Costa Rica. So chloroquine really didn't come up till after the war and uh, in 1947, and again it took on uh, these, uh, this magical, it took on the place of what quinine did, and then, uh, since it had some side effects, and, we, and we'll get into the side effects in, in a second, it went to hydroxychloroquine in uh, 1955. But as you know, these medications have their problems. We know of uh, the one in terms of retinal uh, toxicity in the bullseye of the macula. It has cardiac problems like a long QT uh, interval. You can overdose. Uh, there is quinine toxicity, chloroquine toxicity. Uh, you can have these uh, problems, but it's used in every viral pandemic. This isn't our first coronavirus. We've had uh, coronavirus pandemics before. Uh, I forgot to mention that I did, uh, I worked uh, in a microbiology lab for four years during uh, medical school, and it was part of the uh, trauma research because we were looking at ways to stop uh, uh, sepsis in uh, patients who experience trauma. So I already had a good uh, idea of these viruses and pandemics. And then uh, I wound up writing a book called Flash Micro with my uh, the dean of the medical school who's a microbiologist. So I've already kind of had some exposure to sepsis and uh, pandemics and uh, microbiology, but it's used in every viral pandemic. Coronavirus has been around uh, for several decades. This is our seventh coronavirus infection. Uh, you may remember other coronaviruses inf infections, SARS-1, uh, which was in 2002, and MERS in 2012. Uh, those did uh, not spread to the point where uh, it created the panic that we're having uh, with the with COVID. Uh, it killed far fewer people, less than a thousand in each of those uh, outbreaks. But uh, for this slide, uh, guess what? What the, what the treatment was thrown around for the treatment of uh, SARS one. Plaquenil. Well, what was the treatment for MERS? Uh, Plaquenil. So Plaquenil always comes up uh, as a treatment. Now, what's different in this pandemic is that you had many, not just in the general population, but you had people in the medical community who just kept uh, putting flame and putting gasoline on the fire of hydrochloroquine being the the magic pill that people should take uh, to uh, survive uh, COVID. And, um, you know, in here in the States, you have people who have access to a huge following, uh, like uh, Dr. Phil, who's not a medical uh, doctor, telling people, yes, you should take hydroxychloroquine, you should take Plaquenil. 
which has led to a huge Plaquenil shortage for those people who have lupus and other autoimmune diseases where this disease works. So what's the theory behind uh, these medications is that, and again, I think one of the reasons why it makes it uh, such an easy uh, thing to reach for is that the mechanisms of actions are, are fuzzy. So on the antiviral effect, since it's an alkaloid, it increases the pH, which uh, decreases, uh, and this is a supposed mechanism of action, decreases the intake of uh, these uh, these viruses, but it's never happened. It's never been shown to actually work. And it's a zinc ionophore, which uh, zinc has been known to decrease the replication and release uh, of viruses. But one thing that in communicating with the Chinese doctors early in this disease, yes, this was tried out there, but uh, never been shown to work. It's not being uh, it's not being very successful in Europe, and it's not being very successful in the U.S. And again, I, I tell people just look at the history of these medications, and then you'll understand why this always comes up. And it's good for a government to have something to say. Oh. People don't panic because the last thing that we want is uh, society to panic over these pandemics and things go crazy wild. So that's why you always see politicians say, "Oh, we've got we've got Plaquenil, let's get uh, Plaquenil." And even uh, our president uh, went up there, had the uh, pulpit of America, and saying. Uh, we should all be reaching for chloroquine. It does have anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, so the thought there is that it will stop the cytotoxic uh, storm. Uh, but again, uh, when these patients are far gone uh, with the cytotoxic storm, uh, taking reaching for your Plaquenil is not going uh, to help. So if you talk to people in the field, they'll and you say Plaquenil, they'll go, eh. Um, and when I was doing my trauma research, uh, we were looking at all sorts of anti-inflammatories to stop bacterial translocation and sepsis. And uh, we didn't find at that, this was 25 years ago, none of the non-steroidals and anti-inflammatories uh, really work. Uh, but since we're having this cytotoxic storm, people are reaching out. If and this isn't part of uh, my lecture, if you uh, want to do something or want to give something, you know, vitamin C is uh, uh, less of a toxic uh, uh, treatment that you can give patients, uh, has much more science uh, behind it. And uh, you guys can read about that either in my book or uh, read it on your on your own. So the uh, 